Tim left, he says, well, I'll be away for about six, seven weeks, and you'll be starting First Peter as soon as I leave. Knowing the pace that you normally take when you start an epistle, I'll probably be back when you're in verse 2. That's where we are now. I've been trying to cover, um, uh, you know, I've been trying to build a background, a backdrop to uh, the rest of the epistle. And this is why we spent so long, such a long time talking about, first of all, Peter. We understand that Peter was the one that wrote this epistle. We'll see a bit more information on that today. But the interesting thing we saw when I spoke about Peter is that after all his failures, after messing up so much, after denying the Lord Jesus Christ three times, after hiding away, the Lord still used him. And uh, right after the name, we find the word Apostle. Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also spoke about the elect in verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, to sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you. We'll look in, into that, uh, hopefully, in a couple of weeks. But uh, what, I, what I'd like to do today is look at the recipient, the, the ones uh, where the ones who this letter was addressed to. So we need to go, we need to go back to verse 1. And so let me do the reading this uh, uh, now. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, scattered. And notice where they're scattered all over the place. This would be in modern Turkey. Throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so the epistle is filled with practical admonition concerning the conduct that we Christians need to have or show where, when we are uh, persecuted for our, our beliefs, for, our, for, our, our, uh, for following the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the, in the case of these individuals, these Christians, they, they were vastly scattered, not just in, in Turkey, the area of Turkey, we, we will be looking at some of the history of persecution this afternoon. So you can understand how this persecution became more and more fierce as time went on. So the purpose of this letter is uh, check out your conduct, make sure you conduct yourself like the people of God in a very strange and hostile world. And I think the key verse for this book is found in chapter 2, if you want to go there with me, chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. It says, Dear beloved, I beseech you as strangers, we see the word again, and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against thy soul. Verse 12, having your, when it says conversation, it's really talking about behavior, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may buy you good works, which they shall behold, Glorify God in the day of visitation. So just to give you an idea where we're going with this, first of all, we need to, again, build a bit more of the backdrop, the, the, the scenario, so that later on when we get into verses 4 and on, we can understand what these Christians were going through. At this point in their life, remember this letter is written about 30 years after the Gospels. So it means that Peter's not a youngster anymore. He's not a, as you would say, a spring chicken. He's been beaten um, um, very badly throughout his lifetime. He's been a man now, a mature man. Not the kind of man that he was when he walked with Jesus. Big mouth, um, reacted very, very um, you know, irresponsibly many times. He would always had something to say about every situation. Most of the times he opened his mouth, he was to say something that was un inappropriate. But now, when we open the first epistle of Peter, we find a different Peter, a man who was much more mature. He's been beaten, like I said, he was, he's been persecuted, and uh, he has been um, growing through that through those trials. So, as we move on into the into the book, we will see that he moves from he talks first of all about his position. Uh, he's been called by the Lord Jesus Christ to write this epistle. He's, uh, the Holy Spirit is inspiring every word in this epistle. 
And he addresses this to the pilgrims who are dispersed. And he talks about them not in like, oh, I'm so sorry you're going through this, but you have been elected for this. You have a, I mean, God has elected you for something very special. And you see that word elect several times. And the next time you see it, the third time you see it is in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Verse nine. Look, look at that with me for a minute. So, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. That's a, that means you're special, you're special, right? When somebody says, oh, you're very special, that means you're peculiar. Peculiar people that you should not notice what we're elected to do, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So when in dealing with salvation, it says, you know, now that you're saved, you God has, God has got a purpose for you. He's elected you for something. And immediately as soon as we open up this first chapter, he goes into the duties of these Christians. Now, while you are persecuted, while you are going through this, understand that you have duties uh, with Christ. And he starts talking about, first of all, the, um, uh, in view of their holiness, because you are God's chosen, God has called you to be holy. And we'll see that in verses 13 through 21. When you, when you talk about holy, it's not just have a clean life, it means a dedicated life. Okay, so you say, well, the Lord is calling me to be, live a holy life. He, he just doesn't want you tonight to live a nice, clean, moral life. He wants you to be dedicated to Him. And then when it comes to dealing with even brothers and sisters who are difficult to deal with, He says, show brotherly love with them. And in these, in these trials, remember that the Lord somehow has orchestrated them so that you can grow spiritually. He uses this metaphor of the gold tried by fire. Then in view of opposition, he says, you are strangers. By the way, all of you here this afternoon are strangers, even I. I'm Spanish, but I was born in Madrid, which means that when I came here to Malaga, I was a stranger. As soon as I opened my mouth, people knew that I was a stranger because I had a Spanish accent. And even uh, those who spoke English, so they said, where do you come from? You sound American, but so, you know, it, they, obviously I was a stranger. My wife, when my, my mother met my wife, who's not my wife, but it says, she said, oh, she doesn't understand, she's a stranger. But in this context, he's saying, you, you don't belong to this world. You don't belong to this world. You, you are citizens of heaven. And Peter's going to go into that in chapter 2. And then, meanwhile... <coughs> When we, until we get there, you need to understand that we need to continue serving Him, no matter what condition you're in. Now, you might be thinking, oh, what a responsibility these Christians have. No, if you're a Christian, this goes for you too. Amen? Mm -hmm. You're not convinced. Some of you are like, oh, I wonder. And then he even has a word for the home, for wives and husbands and children, just like we saw in chapter 3 and chapter 4 in the book of Colossians. And then he says, if you're going to suffer, make sure you suffer for the right reasons. Suffer for righteousness. And, uh, and while you're suffering, remember, you're, uh, this, this is not the end of it. We are on our way to heaven. So if persecution takes place, you know what he tells you to do? Rejoice. Now that's not easy. Especially when you suffer the kind of persecution that we're going to be seeing this afternoon. Now, today, in our modern world in the 21st century, here in Andalusia, we really don't understand anything about persecution. But if you were in some countries today where Christianity is forbidden, just for having a Bible, you could be arrested. Just for sharing Christ openly in the street, you could be arrested. There was a time in Spain with the dictatorship of Franco that you couldn't go out and, spend and share a, 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 a gospel leaflet. Uh, I, I, I had friends who lived during that time and said, Sammy, Christians don't know how well they have it today. In our time, when we gathered as, they said, Protestant church, when, you know, we weren't Protestant, we were, we were evangelicals. Uh, they said uh, that it, it could mean that we could lose our job. We, we, could, we would have uh, many of our privileges removed just for saying we're not Catholic, Roman Catholic. So we see that it's Peter, the one, the author, and then we see that there is internal evidence for this. If you move over to chapter 5, we can see that 
the one that writes this epistle has and was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Look, look with me at chapter 5, verse 1. The elder which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and, notice the detail there, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So we have internal evidence that it's truly Peter, but we have other sources, for example, other sources attribute Peter to be the, the, the one who wrote this. Uh, Iranians in the year 185 AD, Clement of Alexandria in, in the 200 AD, Tertullian in the 200 AD, Eusebius, Pamphili in the year 300. So there's plenty of evidence that it's Peter. And you might be wondering, well, where did he write this epistle from? Now, you turn over to chapter 5 and you see the answer for that is, uh, directly in verse 13. And there's quite a bit of debate on this. Let's read it first. This is, uh, and the church which is at Babylon elected this church. You and I would be included in that. Elected together with you, salute you. And so that Mark is my son. Notice it says Babylon. Where is Peter writing from? Well, if you take it literally, he's writing from Babylon. Some commentators would say, well, it could be wrong, really, because, you know, remember in, in uh, Revelation chapter 17, it talks about the Babylon the Great. It's really referring to, to Rome and uh, others like Barnes, Lightfoot, Jameson, um, and, and others argue that this is really talking about Rome. And I would, I, I would take the position that it's not Rome, I take it to face value, I say it would be Babylon, because basically, basically because of those who stand behind the idea. <laughs> One of them is the Roman Catholic Church who would address, who say that Peter was the first pope in Rome. <coughs> I would let others argue whether there was one or the other. I take the literal position. If it says Babylon, I take it as Babylon. And some who would argue against that, they say, well, no, this is really kind of a, a, um, a figurative or more a coded way of saying Rome. Because Peter didn't want to be persecuted, and so he's using a figurative speech. Well, then, Good luck for those in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and Ponto. It doesn't seem to be too concerned about their, them being persecuted. So I take the position, if you take another position, that's fine, that's not a big issue. But I would take the literal position. And if you, you're you wondering um, what the purpose of this writing was, and I think this you find encouragement here, it's to encourage steadfastness in the face of persecution. This is all over chapter 5. Stay firm, no matter what happens. You're not in the losing team, no matter what happens to you. You're a special people. You have been chosen for a special work. And stay strong, stay steadfast in the, in the midst of persecution. And then to remind them of their special privilege as God's nation, or holy nation. And so you, because you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ, as Paul puts it in his writings, you are a holy nation. You say, well, where's my nation in heaven? You know what that means? That you're an alien. <laughs> that means I'm an alien. My citizenship is in heaven. If you're saved, I'm only kidding, but I'm just trying to wake you up. But you know, it really means that we are here for a special mission. And it is also in chapter two, verse 11 through 12, it tells us that it's to instruct them of their proper conduct. Behave as God's elect. You know, in this world in which we live, it seems like many, a lot of churches are just, just want to take, kind of adopt the worldly way so that they can bring people in. I think this is wrong. I think people should be able to see that we're different, that we're not like the rest of the world, it, it's, it's, you know, that when it comes to conduct and things that we approve. I think that and I think scripture is very clear about this. Make sure you stay, you're different. You know, when I went to Australia, just to put you an example, when I went to Australia at the age of seven years old, the people saw me different. And I saw the Australians different also. I saw this other countries as, as, as something as weird, because you know, first of all, you see that the landscape is red, like Mars. Very reddish, Indian red color. 
And then the sky is not like the, the clear blue sky you see here. It's more like a purplish blue. It's, it was like, where am I? You, you, you knew me even, and you were, you know, this is not your home. And as soon as I opened my mouth and they could, they could hear my accent, Spanish accent, they treated me like a foreigner. It took me about nine months to, get, you know, uh, uh, to, um, to catch up with their with the language and to, to kind of be accepted among the kids at school. But you know what it is to be a foreigner in, in a in, in a foreign land. Uh, the people just say, you know, you you don't belong. And when it comes to be a, a, in, when it when it deals with Christianity, people should be immediately immediately able to say, you speak different. You approve different than others. You behave different. You have you pursue different goals. You have different different perspective towards life. So every time I talk to you, 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 you are strange. And so Peter says when they say this about you, rejoice because they're identifying you with somebody else, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So but this afternoon what I'd like to do is do some history study. How many, how many of you like history? All right, some of you are going to be paying attention. Otherwise, some of you, some of you probably fall asleep. I'm not very, I'm not a history buff, but when it comes to biblical history, I'm really I'm all ears. And what we're going to do today is try to understand where they, how they got to this position, where they had to flee. To, I mean, it's, we're not talking about Samaria now or um, um, Antioch, as we see in the Book of Acts. They're really, really far away. And Peter receives news that these brothers and sisters are having a hard time. And, he said, and, and the Holy Spirit reveals to him, saying, saying you know, encourage these brothers. They, they, they don't understand what's going on. It's becoming more fierce, much more fierce. Remember Peter, 30 years ago, when the church was being persecuted in Jerusalem? This is heated persecution. And so Peter is saying, don't don't be surprised that this is happening. We kind of felt, we kind of understood that this was going to happen. That this was going to happen. So let's do a bit of history today. See how um, the church came to this position. Now we need to understand first of all the, the time in which this was written. And according to experts, it's around uh, year 65. Um, it is generally accepted that Peter died, uh, died during the, uh, the reign of Nero. That said, I'm ringing a bell. Nero, the emperor. Nero was a really nice guy. I mean, he was very nice to everybody, very fair to everybody. He was a humble man. No, he was a perverse, wicked criminal. You could probably compare him to Adolf Hitler in a way, because he burned down Rome thinking that maybe he could build a wonderful, uh, sophisticated city that would uh, give him glory for the future centuries. And then later on, when things turned sour for him, he started blaming the Christians. So, but we know it was around the year 65, and since Nero committed suicide in the year uh, 68 AD, the epistle must have been dated before that. Now, a common view is that the epistle was written in the eve of, Nero, of the Neronian persecution, um, perhaps alluded to in chapter 4, if you come with me to chapter 4, verse 12 through 19. It says, Beloved, I think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is, to, uh, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Don't think this is Strange, don't think this is unusual. But since you see yourself in this fiery trial, this, this con fiery condition of persecution, this is my recommendation to you. Take the biggest stick that you can find and stop beating those who persecute you. Now that would be something I would be interested in. But no, that's not what the Lord inspires Peter to say. He says, but rejoice. Inasmuch as you are partakers of, of Christ's sufferings, that even that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So that means that you know when you're being persecuted for the for not to do for not because you're doing the wrong thing, but because you are actually showing Christianity, Christ's likeness in, in the in your midst, 
because they can see this, and because they're persecuted because of this, you have plenty of reasons to rejoice. And when you go to heaven, it says you, you, can, you can experience this exceeding joy that it shows us there. And so, uh, we, we look at the condition uh, that we find Peter here. But I'd like this afternoon to do something. Let's, let's uh, dial, let's put the clock back 30 years. Okay, let's go back in time and try to find, try to understand how this all started. How this persecution has started. 30 years after, remember, First Peter, the, the per persecution has become almost a, a national sport. Even for a, a governor, even for uh, 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 country leaders. But if we go back 30 years, now you need to sharpen up your fingers because we're going to be looking at a lot, at a lot of scripture this afternoon. We need to go back to the book of Acts. And I'd like you to open um, your, the book of Acts in chapter 6. When did it all begin? Well, we find in chapter 7, chapter 6 and chapter 7, the death of Stephen, one of the deacons in the church. But if you move to chapter 6, verse 8, you see how it all began. <clears throat> chapter 6, verse 8. It says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then those, then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of the Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. So you have now Stephen doing street evangelism. And uh, the chief priests and those in the religious establishment heard this and they said, we can't, we can't, you know, we can't let this happen. And so publicly they started debating and Peter's and, and Stephen's wisdom, the way he was directing truth was so, was so powerful that these leaders were gnashing, how do you say, gnashing their teeth. They were like, you know, and uh, they felt like, you know, we need to get rid of this guy. No, look at chapter 7, verse 54. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Have you ever heard, have you ever, no, have you ever met anybody who was so angry that you could hear the teeth gnashing? <laughs> they, were, they were so furious. They wanted this, this loving individual who was sharing the gospel with them, they wanted him dead as soon as possible. And they made sure that they would quiet this guy. They prepared somebody to stone him. And guess who's present at that moment, the one that later on will become the apostle of uh, the, the apostle uh, Paul. You see Paul of Tarsus there, look with me at chapter 8 verse 1, uh, and Saul was consenting unto his death, and, the, and uh, at that time there was a great persecution, underline that because now just when you, this persecution is taking place, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all, the same word we find in 1 Peter 1, scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stayed behind. Who would ever think that this man who was, you know, it was almost like a spiritual James Bond who had a license to kill the apostle Paul, well, later, I mean, uh, Saul of Tarsus would later on convert and become one of the greatest evangelists that, that ever has ever lived. Persecution to, became more and more heated, and only to quieten the, the Christians, only to shut them up and get them out of the way. But instead of shrinking, what they did was the contrary. They found courage to continue sharing the gospel. And as we find in the parable of the, of the sower and the seed, these individuals became like seeds being scattered all over 
only to plant the gospel seed. Notice what it says in Matthew 13, verse 37 and 38. He that sowed the good seed is the son of man. So behind this whole thing is the Lord Jesus himself. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So you see that even, you know, behind this persecution, this is not an accident. This is uh, God working through trouble in order to get the gospel spread all over the place. And, uh, and you see uh, in chapter 8, verse 4 through 6, it says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And then you find another individual, very interesting, which is Philip. He's, he's preaching away in, uh, in Antioch. And he's having a, a wonderful time of revival, seeing many, many people come to Christ. And in the middle of that, the Holy Spirit once again says, Hey, uh, Stephen, we, uh, I need you. I need you to, uh, to go to uh, uh, this desert place. You know the story where he finds this uh, eunuch from Ethiopia, Ethiopia who had an open heart, wanted to learn. And he puts him right there in the middle of the desert, finds this this Ethiopian man, the man gets converted. He goes one way, um, Philip, and the other way, this Ethiopian man doesn't give us his name, only to continue giving the, sharing the gospel in Ethiopia. You see, there's a, there's a church established in Antioch. You see a church established in Samaria. So with, with more persecution, you know what happened? More spreading of the gospel. In fact, if you study the great revivals that have taken place in history, you know when they've taken place? When the church has been at peace and with no trouble, right? No, the opposite. It's only been when the church has been really being grounded down and, they, and the church saw that they only had, they could only hold on to the Lord. How many of you would say, we need persecution today? Can you raise your hand? I don't want persecution for sure though, but you know, the Lord does incredible things through persecution. It's the, the, that's the time when we kind of lose hope in everything that we ever hoped for. We lose our possessions, we lose our influence, we lose our jobs, we lose everything. We don't have anything else to hold on to except the Lord himself. And he says, this is what I have for you, buddy. I need you to continue sharing the gospel. And so we see as this, this persecution taking place. Now, I'd like you to move over. Um, to um, uh, Acts chapter 12. I'd like you to see now how this persecution almost became a political sport for our leaders. In chapter 12, verse 1 and through 4, it says, Now about the time Herod, the king uh, stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. In other words, when he started persecuting the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Notice what he finds. This would be making him very popular. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And you know what he does with him? He puts him in jail. You know the story? I mean, just before Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost, in chapter 2 and 3, you see him preaching and 3,000 come to Christ. Because of that, the, the leaders, the religious leaders, uh, hear about that, they arrest him. They threaten him. You find that you move over to chapter 4 and uh, you see that they said, in whose name, who gave you the authority to preach in this name, Jesus? And they said, well, the, the, the authority, God himself. And Peter stands boldly, not like a, a, a frightened mouse, that, you know, how, which is the way he would behave before the crucifixion. But now he's a roaring lion. And he stands up and tells them, this is, we're not going to stop doing this. And so the, the, the religious leaders tell him, well, then, we got, you know, hold a second, we need to talk about this. And um, they get a really large group there. They look with me in chapter 4. <clears throat> We're moving back a little bit. But notice the, the, the intimidating situation that Peter finds himself before he stands before he stands before uh, Nero. 
In chapter 4, verses, verse 5, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and others a high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. And this large group stands together like, I'm going to show you who the boss is. And here's little Peter and John standing in front. Now, if you, if you, if I want you to see the picture. How would you have behaved in a situation like that? You, you're preaching the gospel. You're sharing the good news of salvation to many people. You're seeing God's hand working. And now these, this large group calls Peter and John and says, uh, excuse me, who, who do you think, what, 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 what do you think you're doing? You, you, don't, you don't understand. Uh, we are in charge here. And you need to understand if you don't shut your mouth and stop preaching Jesus, then something's coming. And they threaten them. They gather there. They threaten them. And uh, Peter stands up and says, Neither is there salvation in any other, but there is none other name under heaven given up among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now that's interesting. They could see Jesus in everything they were doing. This guy is not afraid of us. These individuals are not backing down. And they are I mean, looking at our eyes, they're looking at, the, at us in this big group and saying, we're not, we're not budging. We're, we're going to keep doing this. In whose authority? Uh, it is better to remember what he said. It is better to be men and God than men. And so they come together and they say, you know, what, what, what are we going to do with these guys? It doesn't seem to be working. And look at verse 21. It says, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of, of all the people, for all men glorified God for what for that which was done. What I want you to notice there is that they they preached, they they, they spoke with boldness, with with, uh, with authority. You know what happens right after this? This is interesting. I, I get a kick out of this. They go to the church, they have a prayer meeting. This is good. I mean, because this shows you why we have prayer meetings on Wednesdays. It was probably on Wednesday. <laughs> I'm not sure. But they, they have a prayer meeting. They gather the church. And they said, look what happened to us. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, they, by the way, they threatened us. What are we going to do? And they said, well, Peter stands up. says, well, you know, this is nothing new. It's, you can go all through the Old Testament and see how the prophets were persecuted when God sent them. And some of them were killed. And we're not going to, I mean... We're not going to do different. We're going to, we're going to pursue. And it says in, look at verse 29. Because, first of all, what got them in trouble? Boldness to preach, right? Now, what, what would you ask if trouble came to you? Most of us would probably say, well, I'm going to ask God to remove the problem so I can preach freely. Not what they prayed for. Look at verse 29. It says, and... And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto my, thy servants that with all, very small word, the three letters, all boldness, they may speak the word. What got them in trouble in the first place? <clears throat> Preaching with boldness. So what are they asking now for more trouble? Would that be our prayer? Now, think of this, because I'm going to get to the conclusion and in, 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 to the application very soon. Most of the time when we meet for prayer is, Lord, remove this problem, remove this sickness, remove this situation. Lord, make our lives easier, make our lives more healthy, more comfortable. We normally pray in that direction. But when you see the church praying, when you see the Apostle Paul praying, he never prays for let, let, let things become easier for us. No, it says, let, make us tougher. Make us tougher. Build some backbone. A spiritual backbone in the, in, the, in the church family. And this is what we see here. Now, um, it, so if we move over to chapter 12. Here's Peter um, in front of Herod. 
And he preaches to Herod, and uh, Herod says, uh, well, we need to do something about this individual. He's not backing up or backing down. And so he puts him into prison. Now here's Peter. By the way, it's not just a prison cell. He is guarded by four groups of soldiers. It doesn't make sense. For one guy, four groups of soldiers for one guy. Did they consider him a, uh, a great threat? Did they kind of saw, thought that, you know, just in case some of the mob, the Christian mob comes in and tries to break into, into the prison, we need to have a strong guard. We don't really know, but there's a big, a strong guard there. And Peter's kind of like, all right, time for break. If he was me, I'd probably take a siesta at that moment. And Peter kind of takes it easy, falls asleep, and after a while, tapping on the shoulder. It's an angel. And it says, follow me. Uh, what? Yeah, follow me. Um, we're getting out of here. Uh, you don't understand that that, that corridor there is heavily uh, guarded. Uh, don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. And uh, so I don't know if Peter was fully conscious at that moment, but he follows uh, almost like in, in you know twilight, in a, in a kind of in a dream, he follows this angel, gets out of prison. Nobody seems to have noticed that Peter's not in prison anymore. He walks down the street, nobody there, and he goes to the prayer meeting. You have a group there praying, and what are they praying for? Dear Lord. Peter is in prison for sharing the gospel, for preaching the gospel. Lord, would you please re uh, release him? And all everybody's praying. And by the way, if you look at that passage again, uh, closely, it wasn't just one prayer meeting. This was going on in different houses. So you have different prayer groups. And so they're, they're praying, and uh, they're, somebody knocks at the door. <sighs> somebody typical, somebody late to the prayer meeting. Uh, it's probably... He's probably, I don't know, I'm not getting myself in trouble. But you know, it's somebody late to the prayer meeting. And uh, they send somebody over to, to check and see who it is. Open up. Who are you? Peter? Yeah, it's me. Open up. Boom. They close the little door, the door there and they go over to the group and says, Who was it? You're not going to believe it. <laughs> I think it was Peter. It should be Peter. Peter's in prison. I wonder what kind of faith they were exercising when they prayed for Peter's uh, you know, freedom. But you see this going on there. And, uh, and so, I said, go and check again. You probably, you, you probably, you, you know, you mean, uh, you, there's something wrong with you. Go and check again. And they, so they open the little trap door there, the, the door. And they see that it's Peter. Open up. Yeah, it's Peter. Peter comes in and everybody sees him and says, what are you doing here? He says, well, I don't know. I, this miraculous thing took place. I, I kind of awoke to the situation when I was already in the street. And I realized that I passed the garden, passed the different doors, the different gates, that nobody, I mean, they were uh, you know, heavily guarded. And, and so you see this going on. And, and, and it's a wonderful situation that you see that the Lord is... Uh, working in their midst. That God is doing tremendous things. But when the church is praying, this is the point I want to make, they're not praying, make it easier for us. They understood it was going to be hard. The Lord Jesus says it, those who want to live uh, um, 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 piously in Jesus Christ, you will suffer persecution. Now, you might, it says you will suffer persecution. If you live for me, people will point you out. And so persecution starts spreading. It spreads not only through uh, Samaria, also to uh, Antioch, and then many other places. It started to spread. Again, the, the, uh, Paul is chasing these Christians everywhere. Then finally Paul takes, you know, converts. Now he becomes an, a, an evangelist, a very bold evangelist. Immediately he started preaching. And the church, again, becomes more and more persecuted. And so, what do you do in a situation like this? Let's get to the point. What do you do in a situation? You are unwanted. You are openly rejected. And they had 
to prepare for much larger waves of persecution. So what could these Christians do in a situation like this? If we were persecuted to this level, what could I say to you that would comfort you? A pastor called us today. Things are getting really bad. It's for the word to encourage us. I'm sure it's going to be profound and strong. And pastor gets up and says, how many of you be persecuted? Everybody. And I said, I got a word for you. Rejoice. Let's pray and go home. You think, Pastor, do you understand the situation? Now, there's other things that we could do. We could run away. We could defend ourselves. We could fight back. We could seek revenge. I know what we can do. We could, we could rebel against this rotten government that's doing all this. Right? This is what we would do. And so Peter reminds them, no, 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 hold on a second. You have Christian duties that you must fulfill. And uh, he says, talk to them in the rest of the epistle about those Christian duties. And uh, when you're being wronged for doing right, what do you do? How many of you would come to church again? Knowing that somebody's spying on the church and uh, hoping to arrest you. How many of you would do that? Well, Pastor, I have an idea. Let's go back to the COVID days where we could do uh, um, internet uh, meetings. That would be a good idea. Pastor, I think we better stop being so militant on sharing the good news of salvation. Because it, it, it has to be reasonable. You can be put in prison next week. We better stop doing this. How many of you would say, that's a good idea? Can I see your hand? No, uh, if we understand this epistle, it would be, Pastor, we need to ask for boldness. We can't stop doing this. In fact, we need to shepherd uh, ourselves up a little bit. We need to become better defendants of the faith. We need to uh, be more, more, more discerning. We need to uh, give a stronger message, a more direct message. Pastor, we can't stop doing this. In fact, we're doing exactly what God called us to do. We, this is what we need to continue doing. And here the pastor said, but you can be arrested tomorrow. Well, let them arrest us. That would be our response. What do you do in a situation like this? Next week we're going to go into, into detail with all these different places were Pontius, Galatia, Asia, Bithynia, Cappadocia. But what I'd like to show you is an extract, and I'll close with this, a, a, a portion that was written in the first century by one called Pliny the Younger. Then you've heard about him. He was a Roman lawyer for, um, for one of the emperors. And uh, he was asked to go and investigate how far this Christianity had gone during that century. And he writes back to the emperor and says this. This is a quote from that historical record. It says, talking about Christianity, having influenced all the ages in Bithynia, both young and old, both in the country, and in the cities, so much so that the pagan temples have been almost completely deserted. This is the situation. Imagine the emperor, even in the countryside? I mean, they couldn't spare the countryside? What I want you to understand is this job that these individuals that were carrying this letter had to do was a very difficult one. This region that he mentions covered, and I checked on this, over 750,000 square miles. And they didn't do this, uh, this traveling like I did when I went to Turkey. Last year I had the ch opportunity to go for 10 days to Turkey and I had a chance to first go from Malaga, take a plane, very comfortable plane, over to Istanbul. 
a bus picked us up there. It took us a very nice four-star four, um, hotel and a wonderful uh, buffet, all-you-can-eat dinner. They showed us the room, very comfortable room. The bed was bigger than the one I have at home, nice air conditioning, wonderful shower. You can have a shower. You were you, you even had other facilities down the uh, the basement where you could have a sauna and all that. I said, well, this is really suffering for Christ, isn't it? Then the next day they picked us in the bus, air-conditioned bus, to take it all the way to the east to Cappadocia. That's 700 kilometers away. Every two hours on this air-conditioned, very comfortable bus, they would stop so we could stretch our legs and buy some goodies in the places that we stopped at. Half an hour later, we get back on the bus, do another two or three hours. By the end of the day, it was a long day, most people were saying, oh, this was a hard, hard trip to make. We don't want to do this again. And I thought, I wonder what those Christians thought 2,000 years ago that had to carry this letter. Dusty, curved, you know, curved roads. Didn't have a four-star hotel that they could stay at the end of the day. They didn't have a buffet meal. You get all, all you can eat. Turkish cuisine, which is delicious, by the way. And a comfortable bed to sleep in and then go to the next site. We went to Tiatira, Tiatira. I don't know how to pronounce that in English. You probably don't either. <laughs> uh, uh, Ephesus. Uh, all those places that Paul speaks about where he established churches. We went there, and at the end of the day, I would read passages like this, when I th and I thought, Lord, what has happened to your church? What has happened to me? As soon as we have it this difficult, we're complaining. Would you, would you think, you know, doing... You have to cover 750,000 square miles to be able to take this letter from one place to another. That's going to take months to do. And I would imagine those um, porters, those who carry the, the, the letter, thinking, oh, I can't wait to get there and give some encouragement to my brothers who are going through it. such a hard time. Not complaining. You move 2,000 years forward to the 21st century. Are you ready for this? Here comes the application. I've taken almost 35 minutes to get to this point, so don't miss the point. Put your seatbelts on, because this might hurt. Today, some, some Christians believe that they've done God a great favor for just going to church for an hour. Oh, I was very faithful this week. I did my Bible reading. I even prayed for some of my brothers and sisters. You might think, well, who can think this way? There's a lot of Christians today, they think that just because they've done that, they are faithful. You know what that is? That is the crumbs of Christianity. When we see what these Christians were going through, and how they stood strong in the middle of persecution, having to do hundreds of miles by foot. And when they arrived to the next city that didn't have a comfortable bed to sleep in, probably just had a piece of bread, maybe some cheese in the pocket to comfort their, and you know, comfort yourself and, and be able to move on the next day. They didn't have anything that we have today. We complained so much today and we think that hey I'm being a faithful Christian just because I come to church once a week Faith, folks that's not going to hack it in heaven that's not going to work as we see the contrast we need to think what exactly am I considering true Christianity how easy, how easy is it for me to give up witnessing to those, to the unbelievers? How much would it take for me to give up going to church? 
How much would it take for me to quit sharing the gospel with others around me? How much would it take for me to back up, to back up, uh, back off? But these Christians, it was bring it on. We represent Christ, and that means that we don't belong to this world. We are citizens of heaven, and our hope is in heaven, a living hope, because. Our living Lord is sitting there at the right hand of God. This is where our eyes are set. And while we're here in this world and experiencing this person, this level of persecution, this is not going to discourage us. This is going to make us even stronger because we're going to come before the Lord saying, Lord, you just like Peter did that day in, in Acts chapter 4. Lord, give us more boldness. We're not asking you to remove the obstacles. We're asking you to remove the obstacles of the flesh that's in our heart. You see where this is going? So when we open up, we're going to, we're going to give you more history next week. But then we're going to move over to verse 6 and on. And we're going to see how, Paul, how Peter says, this is your mission. You are a special people. A holy nation. A peculiar peoples, special because God has selected you to be part of this great commission to go and preach the gospel. We think we're doing a great thing because we're supporting 12 missionaries with money to be able to go to different parts of the world. You know what my goal is to have this whole church papered with pictures and their letters being represented, being you know supporters of these individuals. God is a mission-minded God. He was so mission-minded, He sent His own Son to be a missionary. The first missionary to die on the cross. And when He left, right before He left, He said, Go ye and preach the gospel. When the church stops preaching the gospel, it has lost its vision. And when we can be scared away from doing that, by just, just because it's not comfortable, we need to reevaluate what we think Christianity is all about. My call to you this afternoon is don't back up. Back off. How do you say that? Yeah. Back off. But keep pushing. We are, say amen if you agree with me, on the winning team. Amen. Amen. You know what we know that? Because we've read the last page of the Bible. And we know we're going to spend eternity with in heaven. And that's what Peter says. You will greatly rejoice then because of what you've done here. But imagine not doing here what we're supposed to be in heaven. What if we answer the word? I'll leave you with that. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we've seen uh, a little bit of the early persecution in the book of Acts. But when we move 30 years in the, in the, into, into the future where Peter is now writing persecution has become so severe even Peter when he writes 2nd Peter will tell us that he too would be would be dead very soon he knew the time of his death just shortly after he writes this letter of encouragement he writes 2nd Peter and he says my time of uh, li leaving this body Abandoning this body has come short, has come near. But I want to remind you, he says in chapter 1, even though you might know it, I need to shake you up with this truth. We have a living Lord. And while we have life, we need to be serving Him. For both Peter and the Apostle Paul, that meant a wonderful graduation from this body to the next glorified body in heaven. As Paul very clearly puts it, for me to die, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And if I stay behind, it's only because, as it says in Philippians, just because you need somebody to encourage you, somebody to teach you. But if I had my choice, I would go right now. Father, we don't know when our last moment of breath will take place. But we know that we're alive now. And 
if we are truly born again, we need to understand that we were saved not just to go to heaven, but to live a life here on earth that would be God glorifying. I pray Lord, that you will help us understand the truth that we'll be looking at in First Peter. Starting with the sacrifice that those Christians did 2,000 years ago. And then comparing them with what we do today. Help us, Lord, not live committed lives for Christ, but truly surrendered lives for Christ. Nothing else would be acceptable to a living Lord. I pray, Lord, that if there's any rebellion in our heart, that you will somehow break it. Help us, Lord, come to you with a true humility with an understanding that we're not in charge, that you are in charge. With an understanding that as soon as we leave this building, we are called to do something very, very special. To share your son and the work that he did on the cross with those who are lost and, and need to hear the gospel. I pray Lord, that you will help us be more um, directly and decisively involved in evangelism. Work with me, Lord. And as we look towards November, our missions month, help us remember what we heard today. It's not just about giving more so others can go and start churches around the world. It's about those of us who, who are being scattered from, from different parts of the world, Lord, to this part, but wherever you take us, but we have a mission to sow the seed of salvation in the hearts of lost people. Help us, Lord, see that more clearly today than ever before. In Jesus' name, amen.